we are going to move to our next speaker, and that is Eric, who's going to be talking about natural metabolic ecosystems. All right. Thanks. Can you guys hear me okay? All right. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm an ecologist. I want to talk a little bit about the longevity of nature. So I see nature as this, you know, a billion years of open source R&D on how to build a robust system. Um, I've spent a lot of time in ecosystems ranging from the marine environment to alpine ecosystems, which is my, new, my more recent passion. And, um, and at the root of all ecosystems is metabolism. Everything needs to eat something. And so when you add that up, it creates a food web, which is really just a, a network of energetic flows where each species' biomass increases as it consumes and it decreases as it gets consumed. And these are highly nonlinear systems, so they're, they're not analytically tractable. In these models, they're all run by metabolism and biological constraints, and they are chaotic but very persistent and incredibly uh, resilient to knocking them with a hammer and they bounce back. Um, so, so <clears throat> in ecology, um, there was, uh, so uh, ecosystems are these icons of complexity. Darwin called them the entangled bank where species are so interdependent and connected with, uh, dependent on one another. And for a long time, ecologists had this assumption that it was that complexity of nature that gave it its resilience, that complexity begets stability. And in 1972, Bob May, Robert May, published this landmark paper questioning that assumption. And he, um, he, he demonstrated that if you randomly hook up an ecosystem, uh, it, it is inherently unstable and that they, their, their tendency is to crash. And he basically stimulated with this paper uh, decades of work on answering this question, which is, what are the devious strategies by which complex ecosystems don't crash? So rather than seeing the fact that seeing complexity being the source of resilience of ecosystems, people realized that ecosystems were resilient despite their complexity. And so there was decades of work done on that, and that's something that's been really interesting to me is just flipping it on its head. So people started gathering data on what do those systems look like. I'm an empiricist, uh, and so I really love getting data to get the big picture view. Um, this is a colleague of mine who uh, created one, one of the first really comprehensive food webs in the early 90s of Little Rock Lake in Wisconsin, where every ball is a species and they're linked by who eats whom, and then algorithms sort them to find this loose hierarchy of nature. There, there is no such thing as a food chain. <laughs> it's a food web, and, and there is a hierarchy. It's a loose hierarchy because things feed at multiple levels, um, but you can uncover that pattern through you know, with some algorithms. And as we started getting data on more systems, uh, real empirical data, we look like they, they have patterning to them. And you know, from a rainforest to a stream to a lake, the Burgess Shale is a fossil food web from 500 million years ago, from the Burgess Shale that my colleague and friend Jessica, uh, uh, Jennifer Dunn at the Santa Fe Institute put together with a paleontologist. And it doesn't, just with the naked eye, we see there's pattern. If we compare those things to randomly generated webs, we really see that Food webs in nature are non-random. The architecture is very non-random. Uh, and, and if you look at the statistical properties of the structural properties of them, the Burgess Shale web is very similar to contemporary webs. That, that structure, that architecture has been persisted through time, 500 million years, which is really remarkable. Um, so we read things like this, like in school, when, John Muir, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. And it's a wonderful poetic statement, and it makes us learn that everything is connected, but actually this isn't true. Everything is not equally connected, and everything is not randomly connected, and it's that non-randomness which is information about what makes complex systems persist and be robust. Okay, and I, so I want to dive into just four examples of this, that, that non-random, the information that's in that non-randomness. Uh, two of them are structural, and two of them are more about process rates and how they're patterned through in nature. So in the structural sense, going back to these images, one thing that, that, that food webs tend to have is that they're, they're short and fat, and they, they have a wide base at the bottom and, and a narrower top, and the abundance of those species at the bottom is greater, and they're more rare at the top. And... Um, and there's, just as in a, a counterexample to this, there are, with all these things, there's exceptions, exceptions to the rule, but Mono Lake is an ecosystem that is known for being very fragile. And if you, in that ecosystem, 
there are millions of birds from hundreds of species that migrate through the eastern Sierra. This is just east of the east entrance of Yosemite that stop to feed on their migration north and south. And, and they literally, if you go in the spring on the shores of Mono Lake, the birds literally just run with their mouths open, filling their mouths with brine flies. It's, it's really impressive to watch how much they fatten up on food there. Um, but that system is fragile. This is what it looks like. Uh, at the base of it are two species of prime, two prime producers. There's a pelagic one floating in the water column. There's one, a benthic algae, that's on the bottom where there's light on the shoreline. And then there are brine shrimp that feed on the pelagic algae. There's brine fly larvae that feed on the benthic algae. And then stacked on top of that is hundreds of species of birds, water birds that eat brine shrimp, shore birds that eat brine flies, and then birds that eat birds. And this is really, this is a house of cards, as, you, as it looks like, once you stack it up. And indeed, this ecosystem was extremely vulnerable to diversion of water by Los Angeles, fresh water into the aqueduct that raised the salinity of the lake, changed the abundance of brine shrimp and brine fly, birds are declining. It also happens to be a highly controllable system. There's a couple control points. So just by putting fresh water back in, it bounced back, which is amazing. And, um, and while Mono Lake has been around for 700,000 years, it's unclear how long this ecosystem has been there in this state. But, um, but it's, it's an exception to the rule, but it's also known as being fragile. It doesn't have a wide bottom. So that's the first devious strategy is that robust natural ecosystems tend to be short and fat. Um, and some of the shortness comes also from omnivory that, that you don't have long food chains. You have usually top predators also eat things lower down on the food chain and that, that effectively shortens the, the height of the ecosystem. Let me give you a second example that's structural. And this comes from some work that I did recently when the last uh, uh, last decade actually, with some colleagues in Chile, uh, looking at this Chilean ecosystem on the coast of Chile. And we compiled for the first time every known interaction between all the species that live on the rocky shores and the tide pools and everything, because there was a long history of research there. And that included uh, all of the metabolic interactions, who eats who, but also all of the non-metabolic interactions, who helps whom, who competes with whom, in what way, all that kind of stuff. It's, and and we, we published this just a few years ago, um, Network Structure Beyond Food Webs, and it's, to our knowledge, the most comprehensive ecological network that takes into account all of the known metabolic and non-metabolic interactions in a full ecosystem. And then we did some modeling and, and all that to understand its resilience and persistence. Um, oops, sorry, <clears throat> if you wanted that. And so what's really great about these marine systems is that for in a small area, there's a wide diversity of species that is, go back, ah, okay. Uh, a wide diversity of species that's deep diversity. Every branch of life is, rec is represented there. It's not a thousand flavors of beetles. It's very different life forms from tunicates to algae to sponges to anemones to brachiopods to crabs. It's really diverse life forms. And, and so it's a really interesting system to understand diversity of interactions. Um, this is what it looks like where every dot is a species and they're linked um, in various ways. The blue lines are metabolic links, who eats whom. The gray lines are competitive links, who competes with whom, for example, nudging each other off the rock for space, et cetera. And then the, the reddish pink lines are who helps whom, facilitation links. And those links are non-randomly organized, both the metabolic and non-metabolic, and there's a couple hidden structures that we were able to find in them. One is that they sort themselves out into modules or compartments. So here you can see that there, these colors are groups of species that tend to interact more with one another than with the rest of the community, just like a social clique. And those compartments tend to prevent crashes from one place spreading widely to other places. And that's a common thing we see in other kinds of food webs is, uh, is compartmentalization of the webs. Okay. And then there's another hidden structure where while this is groups of species that tend to interact more with one another, um, this pattern is groups of species that tend to interact in similar ways with the same other species. So each color is, um, they're not species that interact with one another, There's, they're species that are similar, that they interact in similar ways with the same other species. So every color is a group of species that are 
exchangeable in a way in terms of their function. And this creates redundancy in the web where one of those species could go extinct and the functional role is replaced by the other species. Um, it also, what it does is it collapses the complexity of the system from hundreds of species to tens of functional species that are similar to one another and that are, you know, I don't want to say replaceable, but, you know, they call it functionally redundant. Um, so that redundancy uh, makes a big difference. So we see this in a lot of other ecosystems and in pollination networks and seed dispersal networks that, that a lot of robust systems tend to be compartmentalized and also have redundancy built into them uh, and, and functional redundancy. Okay, so now I want to move on to two examples that are more about, not about structure so much as about process rates. And they boil a lot down to body size. So one empirical observation is that in natural systems, big things tend to eat smaller things. And there are, we can always think of a lot of exceptions with pests and parasites, et cetera. But we, my colleagues and I, about a decade ago, compiled about over tens of thousands of, of, of examples, a data set of known consumer prey relationships where we had body size information. And this holds across terrestrial marine and freshwater ecosystems that on average, the central tendency is for consumers to be on average, let's say 10 times larger than their prey is a, is a common thing with, with a spread. And, uh, and this has really important implications for process rates. The reason for that is that as organisms get bigger, so on the x-axis here is, is body mass, the y-axis is their metabolic rate. Metabolic rate goes up as you get bigger, but it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. So, so as, you, if, as you double in size, your metabolic rate doesn't double. It goes up to the three-quarter power. It's less than a one-to-one -one line. So your mass-specific metabolic rate, your metabolic rate per unit mass, goes down. And, and, um, and that makes it that large organisms have slower process rates than smaller organisms. And there's a whole theory of metabolic ecology looking at how this particular constraint plays out in, in the abundance distributions of species all over Earth. And it's, it's, for ecology is a very messy science where there's just a lot of noise in the data. This is one of the few areas in ecology where the theory that the lines are super tight and there's not a lot of, it's not a cloud of points to the line through it. They're really tight relationships that are driven by these constraints on metabolism. And there's theories about how that is based on the fractal nature of how energy is distributed in the body. It's really interesting theory, metabolic theory of ecology. But for food webs, what's interesting is that at the same time, um, big things tend to eat little things, and some of that is morphological constraints, like their, their, their mouth size is only so big, so they can't eat things bigger than them, et cetera. That the patterning in food webs means that as you move from the bottom of the web to the top, you tend to get bigger and bigger organisms. And that means that as you go from the bottom to the top, the process rates slow down. And if you run models the other way around, like with, um, with, with parasites and diseases, they, they blow up really quickly. They're really volatile if you have little things eating big things. But if you have big things eating little things, uh, it, it's, it's a lot more stable. It's an inherently stabilizing thing. Uh, and the other thing that happens is that for omnivores, ones that eat across multiple trophic levels, they tend to prefer their lower trophic level level prey. So they, more of the energy comes from lower down in the food chain. And, and then that also is a very stabilizing uh, factor. Okay. So they, they, don't eat the, they don't eat the kind of large things they tend to eat. They, they eat, they'll, they'll eat, let's say if you have a spread in your diet, um, um, the smaller things tend to be more abundant. And so just uh, optimal foraging means that they tend to eat more lower on the food chain. And you see that if you do stable isotope analysis of their guts, that, that more of the energy is coming from lower down in the chain. So that's a very common thing. And again, that, 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 that shrinks the height of a lot of food webs because long, skinny webs are very unstable, are very fragile. So wide fat webs or uh, short fat webs are, are more stable. Um, and the emergent property of that is when you add it all up and you run the models and even in, in nature and what you observe is that many interactions become weak, many relations, and, and a few are strong. So most of the links, so this is actually an empirical web from, uh, from the Caribbean, a marine food web by Jordi Bisconte, who's a friend and colleague. 
And, and all the links are energy flows between the species who are all just laid out in a circle. And a few of them are really strong, a lot of biomass flowing, and most of them are very weak. And that actually is an emergent property of the patterning of how body size is in food webs and the constraints of body size on metabolism. And then, it, and then this comes out. And we, when we run simulations, same thing, we get this as an emergent pattern of, of nature. And, and the consequence of this is that long chains of strong interactions, long loops, are, are generally weak because all it takes is one weak link to break a chain of interactions. And there's a lot of work on this that's been done but, you know, a while ago where weak links in long loops and food webs are very stabilizing because it just prevents these big feedback, strong feedback loops from cycling and causing volatility. Weak links in long loops. We also observe this when we, we did simulations of thousands of ecosystems based on metabolic um, rules that, that are constrained to be biologically plausible. And we, what we did was we did these knockout experiments with thousands of ecosystems and hundreds of thousands of, spe of relationships. And if we would knock out a species and then see how everybody else changed, and for every one of those relationships, we know is it one degree away, two hops away, three hops away, four hops away, the, the, the y-axis is the strength of that response, either a positive response or a negative response, and then the x-axis is how many hops away was the species we were observing. And you can see there's a lot hovered around zero, which is a lot of interactions are weak and inconsequential, but that the maximum responses are strong one hop away and they dampen very quickly with distance. So again, um, you hit it with a hammer, it doesn't propagate far. And this is a very important property of robustness of ecosystems. Um, so what that means is that this quote is just wrong. If every time we swatted a fly or killed a mosquito, it propagated strongly far and wide, all these things would crash. Because every single day, things are little disturbances are happening and they don't crash. And the reason for that is because, because perturbations don't travel far. And, and that is, a, it's not a, that, that is a, an emergent property of a lot of other things that have to do with the patterning of, of, of interactions. Um, so a last one I want to share that's around process rates has to do with, with uh, dead stuff in nature. So if we look at, um, okay, so, sorry, this was just a summary of that one. Big things tend to eat small things. The patterning of that means that uh, disturbances don't travel very far. So the final one, is around dead stuff. And one of the things that I only learned this um, uh, later in my career by collaborating with a microbial ecologist, that only 10% of the biomass of plants and terrestrial ecosystems is actually consumed when it's alive. 90% of it is consumed and processed and metabolized when it's dead. So this whole decomposition ecosystem is 90% is of, of terrestrial plant biomass is processed when dead. And what that means is that it has a very different process rate. So what it means is that um, every species in an ecosystem is, is two degrees from dead stuff. These are two lakes where every dot is a species and they're linked by who eats whom. The circled one in red is detritus, or just or dead stuff, basically, uh, leaf matter, et cetera, that's um, uh, broken down. And what's highlighted are all of the species that are two hops away from dead stuff, which is 90% of the web. And this is throughout all the webs that we looked at, uh, over 90% of the species are only two hops away from dead stuff. That means that every consumer resource uh, interaction is coupling uh, green energy channels and brown ones. And if you look across these, so, so if it's a predator that's uh, herbivores that are eating um, plants and ones that are eating uh, detritivores that are eating dead stuff, uh, there's two energy channels, a slow one, which is dead stuff, and a fast one, the green energy channel is faster. And so consumers are coupling like a diverse portfolio, fast and volatile channels that are more productive and lower productivity but slower channels. And this, again, has a stabilizing effect by coupling uh, 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 oscillators that are not in sync is a very stabilizing factor. So that's the fourth devious strategy by which nature doesn't crash, is uh, slow and fast en energy channels through dead stuff are, are coupled um, on different, so those different time scales tends to be st stabilizing. And just to recap, 
We started for many years in ecology with, and this is still a common assumption based on what they teach in school, is that complexity begets stability. Um, instead, ecologists have been working for decades on the reverse of this, which is why don't complex ecosystems crash? Because by default, if they're randomly connected and equally connected, they, they would. Um, and so some of the devious strategies include natural ecosystems that are robust tend to be short and fat, they're compartmentalized and have redundancy. We see this again and again. Um, big things tend to eat little things. Slow process rates are stacked on top of fast process rates. And uh, those consumers are coupling brown and green energy channels, which also have very different process rates that are out of sync with each other. And the result of that is that you end up with this emergent pattern of most of the relationships are kind of weak and only a few are strong. And that means that if you hit it with a hammer, disturbances don't propagate very far. Uh, they don't hop very far. And long, strong chains of interactions are rare. So the examples that we learn of these trophic cascades that are really impressive of, you know, this affects that, which affects that, which affects that, those actually are very rare in, in real systems. Um, but they capture our attention because they're, really, uh, they're really fascinating. So um, the recurring theme on all of this is that, yes, everything is connected, but everything is not equally connected, um, nor is it randomly connected. And it's really that non-randomness of the patterning of the architecture of nature that is where this library of information about longevity exists. Um, so that's all I had to share with you. Thank you. Thank you.